Fairy tales have a funny way of getting into your head. I always try to tell my mother that I can see things. Like I was dreaming when I was awake. someone gets their own fairy tale told about them and if I'd even want that she told me a few little strange little things are you kind or no Whenever I get asked to recommend a good horror movie, I immediately take into consideration who I'm recommending it to. The key to a good movie recommendation is to complement the other person's taste and suggest something that will comfortably expand their horizons. It also helps if the movie that you're recommending is criminally underseen for how incredibly well made it is. In 2020, yes, that 2020, the entire world was affected by unprecedented events that caused the everyday lives of everyday people to dramatically change. One of the many industries that suffered during this time was the movie theater industry. It was rough, it was stale, it was f***ing Groundhog Day. At first, there were delays. Movies just weren't coming out at all. Then, some that were meant for theaters and IMAX ended up going straight to streaming. Delays, delays, and more delays. And before you knew it, the days of limited theatrical releases were starting to come back. Movies were starting to exist outside of our living rooms again, and for the everyday Joe Blow, that meant new stories and adventures that were awaiting us at our mecca, the happiest place on earth, the movies. Only now, people weren't going. Listen, I have a movie recommendation that I simply cannot sit on any longer. You need to watch Gretel and Hansel. Yes, I know that the cult classic Jeremy Renner-led Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters is going to be spammed in the comments of this video, and yes, it is an underrated and fun gem that deserves more respect, but no, I'm not talking about that one. Although... Instead, today I'm going to tell you why I think Gretel and Hansel is a forgotten masterpiece and why you should revisit it. After this video, of course. Gretel and Hansel is the 2020 horror fairy tale starring Sophia Lillis as Gretel and Samuel Leakey as Hansel. The film was written by Rob Hayes and directed by Oz Perkins, who happens to be the son of iconic psycho actor Anthony Perkins. Although, he is a talented filmmaker in his own right with films like The Black Coat's Daughter and I Am the Pretty Thing Living in Your House. I know for sure that Tyler is going to notice that I once again found a way to talk about Alfred Hitchcock movies on this channel, so please like the video so he doesn't send me into the woods. or I'll hack you into tiny little pieces. Gretel and Hansel is a similar take on the fairy tale, but this time it's told with a cold and sadistic intent. It mainly focuses on the character of Gretel, who, after refusing to sell herself to a wealthy businessman, is forced by her extremely scary mother to take Hansel and journey deep into the forest to find themselves new lives. This movie doesn't waste any time sending these kids into the woods either. The movie's plot is fairly simple, and I'd argue that it's not exactly the most important thing to the viewing experience for this particular film. While venturing through the cold and foggy woods, Gretel and Hansel will encounter the dangers of being young and vulnerable in a very evil place. I've heard some criticism that this movie is boring, and to that I say... What the f*** are you talking about? It isn't scary for me, and it helps me go to bed. As if the movie's gorgeous and rich cinematography wasn't enough, which it is and we will be talking more about that later, the movie drops two kids off in the middle of nowhere five minutes in and they're immediately in danger with scary monsters, suspicious strangers, and some very questionable mushrooms. <laughs> And that's just the least of their worries. 
After some close encounters with the threats that lurk in the forest, Gretel begins experiencing hallucinations that guide her and Hansel to a cozy cottage in the middle of nowhere. The kids are starving, and whoever lives in the house seems to have prepared enough food to feed a giant family. Now, if you think you know what happens next, don't you dare be so sure. See, this is where the real darkness of the movie ensues. Inside this home is an old and mysterious witch with black fingertips and a sinister grin. And while Hansel quickly trusts her, Gretel isn't so quick to succumb to the temptations and hunger that motivate the two siblings. You may think that the witch just fattens up the two kids and then eats them and that's the movie. And I'm sorry, but you're wrong again. Finders keepers. Instead, this film takes the approach of having Gretel's arrival at the witch's cottage be a place where she can learn about her hallucinations and why she has them. Would it surprise you to learn that in this movie, Gretel herself is a witch? He decided to wake it up after all. While staying at the old woman's home, Gretel will learn things she never expected or knew she was capable of, and when the time comes, she'll have to use those powers to defeat her mentor and save her brother from a horrific death. And like she had done, I rid myself of all other attachments. I cleared my place. I ate my children. Hey, uh... Does that sound boring to you? This movie establishes at the beginning what seems to be an origin story for the witch, but instead it turns out that Holda, the witch, was actually the mother of the little girl from the story, and she killed and ate her own daughter before continuing the same ritual for many, many years. Until now. There was a Thomas and an Isabella, a darling William. <laughs> Gretel not only learns about her supernatural abilities, but she also learns from Holda herself about the internal power that exists inside of her as a person. Now, why should you watch this movie if you haven't seen it, and why should you re-watch this movie if you have seen it? Well, this movie offers you all the slow burn intensity that you want from a folklore period piece fairy tale. It also gives you the creatures, frightening moments, and adventures that keep you invested. And because I don't know if I really mentioned this enough, this movie's visual style is a f***ing treat. It's shot in the very vintage looking 1551 aspect ratio, which usually I can kind of give or take, but in this case it just had to be done this way. The use of wide-angle lenses and distorting fisheye clashing with that tight aspect ratio gives a liberating yet claustrophobic look that really connects you to these characters and how they're feeling, being both free to roam the world and yet trapped in the woods. The color grading, the wardrobe, the composition, it's all stunning. If Wes Anderson made a horror movie, I have a feeling it would look something like this. I also need to talk about this movie's score. I'm in the process of listening to it on loop for like the millionth time this month and I'm still in love with it. Robin, or Rob Cowder, did the musical tracks for the movie, and the use of retro synth risers and youthful and yet somehow whimsical orchestral themes are brilliant. I would love to know what those of you who love movie scores think about it, because I am obsessed. It makes the slow moments of the film that don't feature much dialogue still very stimulating to watch. And that is a good word to describe this movie. Stimulating. We of course can't forget Sophia Lillis' excellent performance as she carries much of the film on her shoulders and does so with grace and subtlety. I always look forward to seeing this actress in any project, and this one is well suited to her and her acting sensibilities. Careful with that, dear. I'd hate for you to start something you can't stop. Of course, Alice Cridge does a wonderful job as the oddly charming yet still horrifying witch. I loved her in this movie, and I think she gave a perfectly committed and delicate performance, which was equal parts charming and creepy. Well, another one bites the dust. It definitely stands out among witches in movies. Oz Perkins is a name that I would also like to see attached to more movies in general. I mean, the guy was in Legally Blonde for like two minutes and has made some of my favorite horror films in the last decade. 
But this movie shows me that he's a creative mind that we should definitely be on the lookout for. In fact, if you're still not convinced about watching this movie, let's look at some of the other names that are attached to its creation. Rob Hayes co-wrote the film, and you would know him as the writer of the popular TV series Chewing Gum. It was produced by Brian Cavanaugh Jones, who was behind Sinister, and also produced by Autopsy of Jane Doe producer Fred Berger. You know what's consistent across all of those people? They all make really good shit. Director Oz Perkins had this to say about the film. It's awfully faithful to the original story. It's got really only three principal characters, Hansel, Gretel, and the witch. We tried to find a way to make it more of a coming of age story. I wanted Gretel to be somewhat older than Hansel, so it didn't feel like two 12 year olds, but rather a 16 year old and an eight year old. There was more of a feeling like Gretel having to take Hansel around everywhere as she goes, and how that can impede on one's own evolution. How our attachments and the things that we love can sometimes get in the way of our growth. I thought all was required for me was to be brave. I had to trust myself. Gretel and Hansel hits you in the senses from the very opening and all the way through until the time the credits roll. You'll be looking at beautifully composed images with top tier acting from the brilliant Sophia Lillis and a musical score that will chill you to the bone, all while maintaining a sense of childlike adventure that weaves a crafty, beautiful, twisted, and unnervingly forgotten masterpiece. If you're in the mood for a dreamy fairy tale with dark and twisted scares, beautiful music, and even more beautiful visuals, revisit this one for yourself. And maybe sleep with the light on. Good night, everybody. Oh, but not really.